Hello and welcome everyone. We are so excited to present this webinar to you tonight about what we do here in the Head and Neck Endocrine Oncology Department at Moffitt Cancer Center. We are so grateful for your participation tonight and we hope that you find everything informative. I have to read some important language here, so I appreciate your patience. Next slide, please. The content is not intended to be medical advice and the viewers should consult their physician should they have any questions. The viewers should not try to rely on information contained in this presentation slash webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of information contained in this presentation or webinar. So next slide, please. So I'm one of your moderators tonight. My name is Dr. Caitlin McMullen, and I'm a surgeon in the Department of Head and Neck Endocrine Oncology. I'm grateful for my co-moderator, Dr. Kadar Katani, who practices medical oncology. We have some amazing presentations for you tonight from some of our really fantastic department members. And I'll briefly provide an overview of what we do because we cover a lot in our department. So next slide, please. We treat a number of diseases affecting the head and neck, including throat cancer, oral cancer, sarcoma of the head and neck, sinus and skull-based tumors, benign head and neck or oral tumors, benign thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, and parathyroid disease. So there's a lot that we do here. Our physicians cover all the bases. Our surgeons practice both major open and minimally invasive procedures. Our medical oncologists provide innovative chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and other systemic, meaning IV or oral, um, or injectable medications. And we're fortunate to have endocrinologists in our team that specialize in managing benign and malignant conditions of endocrine organs, such as the thyroid, adrenal glands, and pituitary glands, amongst others. We are an academic and teaching institution, and we're fortunate to play a critical role in the training of future medical leaders, including residents and fellows in numerous specialties, surgery, and medicine. We're always striving to develop new innovative ways to improve outcomes and patient care through research. Our group is enhanced by a multidisciplinary team and supporting team members that include radiation oncologists, speech language pathologists, nutritionists, dedicated nurses, advanced practice providers, physical and occupational therapists, social workers, medical assistants, research assistants, and so many others. And we're so grateful for all of them and their ability to help us provide the best care for our patients. Um, so if you can advance to the next slide, please. Here you can see a little bit uh, uh, of the day in the life here at Moffitt in our department, treating our amaz amazing patients. Um, we're so grateful to have you here today with us, working with our wonderful teammates in the operating room and clinics and training future generations of doctors. So without further, further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kurtani, who will introduce our first speaker. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as Dr. McGowan said, my name is Kedar Kurtani. I'm one of the medical oncologists here. Um, and I wanted to introduce Dr. Jamil Muzaffar. He is an assistant member in our department and he's a medical oncologist and he will be discussing innovative clinical trials in head and neck cancer. I think Dr. Muzaffar, you may be muted right now. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming uh, to this webinar and helping us and encouraging us. So before we go further, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist. I treat patients uh, who get, have head and neck cancer with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and, and offer them clinical trials. Uh, after, <clears throat> well, perform, um, after completing my fellowship, I've been working here for the last uh, three years. And my main um, role is to, uh, as a, a clinical trial specialist, is to uh, run uh, clinical trials, design new uh, innovative options for our patients, and then uh, also, you know, carry on the research. Next slide, please. So let me give you uh, <clears throat> a brief uh, outline about our patient population. Now, Moffitt is an NCI designated cancer center. It is, uh, it has the, you know, a huge population base being uh, referred to us from uh, the whole of uh, the Southeast area. Next. So 
on an average, uh, every year we see about a thousand patients who are uh, diagnosed with head and neck cancer who come to our clinic uh, either as a referral from outside physicians or they directly come to us because of uh, their uh, cancer. About 60% of the patients are newly diagnosed uh, who have potentially curative disease and who would be seen by a surgeon or radiation oncologist. And or most likely these days we have our multi D clinic where we see a lot of patients and devise their uh, treatment plan right away. About 40% of patients are coming here because uh, they are looking, they have been treated by outside physician, they have metastatic disease and they are coming for second opinion or trial options. And this is where uh, my role comes in, uh, in uh, you know, offering them in innovative trials. Currently, um, we have about four in, uh, industry spon uh, uh, investigator initial trials, and we have several uh, industry sponsored trials going on. And I'm going to give you a brief outline of what we are doing and what is coming up. Next, please. So our clinical trials can be divided into four parts. Uh, number one is the radiation oncology based trials where radiation is going to be the primary treatment. These are patients who are coming for curative intent or who have locally re recurrent or persistent disease. Next. So in this setting, currently we have about five clinical trials and several in the pipeline. Next. This is my big area of uh, work is metastatic head and neck squamous cell cancer. Uh, most of them are either newly diagnosed or pre-treated or persistent disease and are coming here either for standard of care or a clinical trial next. <clears throat> and in this uh, setting, we have about uh, seven uh, clinical trials ongoing next. Because of the location of our cancer, we also see uh, salivary gland cancers. Now, these are very rare cancers, but because we have uh, a big population base, uh, we have patients coming here exclusively for treatment and trials. So we have two uh, salivary gland uh, trials going on at this time and a couple coming in the pipeline next. Our team also takes care of endocrine-related cancers, most commonly thyroid, adrenal gland, and paragangliomas. And uh, you know we have uh, one thyroid uh, cancer uh, trial open right now, and we just opened an adrenal cancer trial. Next. Now, this is uh, what our, our trial portfolio has been looking like. Uh, as you see, this uh, graph tells us how many patients we have been put, putting on trials. And about five years ago, we, we were enrolling about 20 or less than 20 patients in the trial. And in the last couple of years, we have made a lot of progress. And currently, uh, in, the, in the last uh, cycle, about 2019-20, we have placed about 100 patients on clinical trials. So we have made remarkable progress in terms of how many patients we are treating with innovative options, plus uh, you know the, uh, what, uh, and that also changes our goals going forward in the future, uh, and what are we going to plan to do uh, in future next? So I'm going to touch base and discuss just a few of the, more of the most important trials that we have going on right now. Now this one is an NCI-based uh, ECOG trial where uh, we are trying to give immunotherapy as a maintenance treatment for patients who already have a potentially curative disease. Now, this is specifically for HPV uh, positive cancers who are uh, intermediate risk or locally advanced patients. So uh, what we are doing here is that apart from the standard of care chemo radiation, we are adding immunotherapy in one of the arms uh, as maintenance. This trial is ongoing. We, are, we have got good uh, recruitment in this trial and hopefully We'll have some uh, very uh, pr uh, promising results out soon. Next. This is our second patient population, which is patients who have um, disease which is not amenable to uh, uh, curative treatment anymore. That means our surgery team cannot get rid of it. Uh, our radiation oncologists cannot get rid of it. So in this, again, one of the most important areas of research in uh, head and neck cancer these days, or for that matter, most cancers is uh, immunotherapy. So here, this is a very innovative trial. We're trying to combine uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, with an immunotherapy for patients who have recurrent metastatic disease and are not amenable to uh, curative treatment. So this is <clears throat> something that might in the future we, we expect to be uh, practice changing. <clears throat> Next. Now, this is a study for, for which my co colleague, Dr. Kartani is the, is the principal investigator here. This is again a very innovative study uh, involving um, HPV related uh, T cell receptor engineered cells. This is uh, like 
uh, one of the newer areas of research uh, involving cellular therapy options to uh, develop uh, treatment options for these patients. Very intensive treatment uh, patients who need to be SB positive, SLA uh, positive. Uh, and I think this is one of the studies that is going to be uh, uh, having a lot of potential for future development. Uh, it's very intense, but we have a very strong um, IST uh, group team who takes care of these patients, and we have had very, uh, you know, encouraging results. Next. Again, uh, this is another area of research that we are uh, concentrating on. This is a trial where uh, we are using tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes uh, to treat the patient's cancer. This is for both HPV-related and unrelated cancers where a tumor uh, sample is being taken up, it is being uh, processed and is being infused back to the patients. Next. Now, this is one of the trials that uh, studies that we are going to develop slowly. Uh, what the new, re new research is showing is that gut microbiome and what is going on in that area of our body has a very important role in how patients respond to immunotherapy. So we are trying to develop this as a biomarker and also using this as a modulator so that we can try to make treatment responses better. And we have some exciting uh, trials which have been funded. Uh, these are grant funded studies, uh, which, are, which we have just started doing um, next. So one of the things that we know that the cancer is not just a isolated event. It's a whole set of things coming together, including genetics, diet, other environment factors, and then that affects how our bacteria are going on in the gut, what are they doing, and this results in human disease and also how we respond to the disease. Next. So in this study, for example, what we are doing is we are collecting patient's stool sample and are sequencing it and looking at metagenomics. We're also looking at what the bacteria are producing in the gut and we are trying to combine that information together to see how these are affecting uh, treatment outcomes and how we can make that better next. So this will help us to design um, you know, treatment outcomes. We are trying to develop fecal microbiota transfer where we are trying to get fecal samples from patients who are very high responders to immunotherapy and transplant them in patients who are poorly responders to see if that helps to improve outcome. We are also studying uh, various other methods to improve um, and change microbiota to help patients. And one of the things that we are trying to do is something called prolonged nightly fasting, where we are seeing how fasting improves the outcomes of these patients. Next. So overall, uh, if you look at our goals for the future, as I said earlier also, we are trying to enroll more and more patients in a trial because head and neck is an area where standard of care treatment options are just not good enough and we want to make them better. So our goal at present is to make sure that, try to make sure that at least 50% of our patients who are coming here with metastatic disease are treated on a study protocol. We are trying to utilize more and more targeted therapies using next-gen sequencing to design trials for personalized care, make the care specific for that patient's cancer. Cellular therapy, as I discussed before, is coming up in a very important way, and we think that has a lot of potentials, including vaccine studies. We are also trying to get innovative industry-sponsored phase one and investigator-initiated study started. And again, some of our exciting exploratory and correlative studies are incorporated, and we are trying to combine them with uh, you know, clinical studies and design trials to see how we can make the whole body work together uh, to uh, help patients fight cancer and get better response to treatment. Uh, currently, we have two NCI trials and about eight industry-sponsored trials in the process of being started. So we hope that uh, going forward, we are going to be able to offer better and better options and more options to our patients. I think uh, for the sake of time, I will stop. And if, patients, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, um, you know, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks so much, Dr. Muzaffar. Um, I know that was difficult to go through all of those trials and all the research that we're doing in our department so quickly, but we appreciate it. And I think the questions, there's going to be a Q&A session at the end, so I'm sure some questions may come up about potential research opportunities. 
So next on the agenda, I wanted to introduce Dr. Krupal Patel. He is an assistant member also in our department. He is one of our wonderful head and neck surgeons, and he is going to talk about head and neck surgery and the experiences of um, surgical patients at Moffitt. Thank you, Dr. Kirtani, um, for the introduction. Um, I see that there are a lot of uh, uh, my own patients in the in the uh, attendance. So, um, what my hope is that in the next uh, seven to ten minutes, uh, to showcase what um, what patients head and neck uh, patients experience, both on the surgery side, but also um, uh, head and neck cancer patients in general and um, uh, some research uh, opportunities that uh, I'm part of. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, next slide. So uh, of course my role uh, uh, as I see as uh, a surgeon uh, and a clinician, but I also have some active research interests in cancer care delivery. Uh, we know that head and neck cancer um, time is of the essence when we uh, embark on treatments, and so we want to ensure that there's appropriate care, uh, um, and so that's one of my major interests, along with uh, translational research uh, where we can uh, identify uh, patients and recurrences sooner and uh, uh, provide more personalized treatment, as Dr. Muzaffar had mentioned. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of the uh, head and neck uh, cancer, uh, there are several challenges of uh, head and neck surgery in itself. It's a very complex 3D anatomy. Um, it uh, is broken down into several uh, subunits, uh, and each uh, uh, subunit has a function along associated with it, um, and uh, technically uh, challenging to reach some of the subsites, um, which include uh, back of the throat and the voice box. Um, uh, and uh, uh, sinonasal areas uh, in the nose. Next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, as has been mentioned uh, earlier, we all work as part of a multidisciplinary team uh, and it really uh, is patient-centered. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, uh, things if I can convey uh, from uh, this uh, seven, 10 minute talk is that that is the critical part. Um, uh, you know, we, we, it starts with our clinical staff and schedulers. Uh, we have wonderful nurses in the clinic. A lot, uh, I would anticipate uh, pretty much every patient has uh, had the opportunity to interact uh, uh, and um, uh, interact with our clinic nurses and how wonderful they are. We have a great nurse navigator who uh, uh, coordinates care, our uh, advanced nurse practitioners. Um, uh, of course, there's clinicians. Uh, and uh, me as a surgeon, uh, along with uh, the rest of the surgical team, uh, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and pathologists, and we all form this uh, multidisciplinary team. More importantly, we recognize that uh, and that cancer patients, there are a lot of other needs that come along with it. And we have a wonderful social work team led by uh, Camille, uh, speech pathology, speech language pathologist, uh, uh, led by Aaron Gadera, uh, dietitians that are as part of the team as we uh, recognize nutrition is equally important. And for surgical patients, you know, it's uh, uh, what, we, what we can operate on and we are push, really pushing the boundaries. And we can do that when we have a sort of well oiled machine on the operating room side. Uh, and of course, the support staff that we require for these very, very complex uh, uh, surgeries that can last anywhere between 12 to 15 hours uh, at a time requiring uh, multiple surgeons and their expertise. Next slide, please. Um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, um, and a lot of my patients uh, have heard me say this, but really the cancer dictates the type of uh, treatment uh, that is required and specifically the type of surgery that is required as well. At times we can provide minimally invasive approaches, which, are real, uh, which we are expanding at Moffitt which include transoral robotic surgery for hard to access areas at the back of the throat and the waist box. Uh, we can also do laser microsurgery for those areas. And uh, we can also provide endoscopic uh, nasal surgery where we can access uh, the big tumors uh, that are invading the nose and coming in very close proximity or even invading the brain and provide that uh, appropriate resection uh, going through this and through the nasal corridor when. Um, 
when the other uh, treatments uh, fail in order to provide uh, uh, care. Uh, the other uh, important aspect of my clinical practice and uh, surgical uh, realm is facial reanimation procedures where uh, the salivary glands or the spit glands uh, that involve the, the parotid gland, which are on the side of the cheek, where the facial nerve runs through, uh, needs to be either removed uh, if it's invading the tumor uh, and how to reanimate the face in an appropriate manner where we can uh, achieve good cosmetic and functional outcome. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the challenges that I've alluded to uh, uh, for head and neck reconstruction, each, uh, each part that we remove has a functional impact. It's there for a reason. Uh, it also impacts cosmetic, uh, cosmetically. It's a very complex 3D anatomy. And uh, sometimes uh, these surgeries are done in the setting where other therapies uh, fail or they have been tried and successfully treated the cancer. However, there are long-term side effects that uh, patients experience or the cancer comes back years down the line where we need to treat them uh, with surgery. Uh, the goals of the reconstruction uh, include adequate coverage of the deep tissues, uh, a safe wound uh, to start other treatment therapies if the patient requires. Uh, ideally, we wanna restore the function as best as we can. And also uh, keep in mind that cosmesis is equally important in achieving that goal uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, when I talk about surgery and reconstruction for head and neck, really it, it go, it's a ladder and, and what, I, what I refer to as a reconstructive ladder where the wound can be let, uh, let, let it heal on its own or we can put it together. Uh, sometimes we can use a skin graft from uh, somewhere else in the body. We can use other uh, areas uh, adjacent to the wound where we can bring the new tissues in. Uh, or, or finally, where we need a, what's called a free flap, where we bring the tissue from far away site with its own blood supply, and then we um, uh, hook up the blood vessels, uh, the arteries and the veins, uh, the pipes that drain blood into the tissues and the pipes that drain blood out of the tissues into the neck. And these are the uh, complex cases that can last for several hours uh, at a time and require multiple surgeons and their expertise along the way. So that's, that's really the, one of the more complex uh, sur surgeries that we do and we offer at Moffitt. Next slide, please. Uh, these free flaps, uh, as I mentioned, can be taken from several different sites. Uh, and once again, I go back to the fact that the, the cancer really dictates the type of surgery and also the type of free flap that we, uh, that we can uh, obtain and utilize to restore the function and the form. And as you can see from the diagram, we take tissues from the arm, we can take tissues from the leg, we can take tissues from the belly, uh, from the back. Um, and uh, thankfully the surgical expertise here at Moffitt uh, uh, provides uh, those opportunities where we can really leverage uh, the best type of tissue to reconstruct uh, for appropriate form and function. Next slide, please. Uh, and the following slide. Uh, in terms of my research interests, like I mentioned, uh, I have an active uh, research interest in symptom management uh, of uh, head and neck patients. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at uh, um, is how can we educate um, and uh, uh, cr uh, create a better discharge planning process for our head and neck cancer patients, uh, because there are the, the, the requirements after discharge are substantial um, uh, throughout the convalescence at home. Uh, and, and finally uh, getting uh, patients uh, to get their uh, adjuvant treatment. The other uh, uh, big component of that is how can we monitor patient symptoms during treatment uh, to reduce the patient burden? And this is primarily through patient reported outcomes and um, one of the novel studies that uh, we want to pilot is to use wearable devices such as Fitbits and assessing uh, those uh, symptoms and catching the impact of those symptoms early so that we can intervene almost in a real-time basis and improve uh, the outcomes as we go forward. Next slide, please. The other important uh, research, uh, compo uh, research interest of mine is financial hardships that patients face. As we all uh, recognize that uh, cancer uh, 
not only drains patients emotionally and their family members, but it also impacts the financial status quite substantially. Um, and so one of the things that we have started to look at uh, is to assess the financial hardship that patients experience. You know, the, the first, this is a very relatively new field uh, that people are recognizing the need to improve on. And so we don't really have that much data specifically in head and neck cancer populations. And so one of the first steps uh, that I have uh, ongoing study and funding for is to first recognize what the problem is and the scope of the problem by uh, surveying the patients and also by uh, interviewing the patients and then ultimately coming up with interventions and better providing uh, uh, counseling where we can alleviate some of the cancer-related financial hardship. It's never going to go away, we recognize that, but what the goal is to minimize the impact of it and improve uh, cancer care delivery. Next slide, please. Next slide. The other, uh, oh, the previous slide. The other major uh, component of my uh, uh, research interest uh, that I'm actively pursuing is to, uh, as Dr. Musafar alluded, to uh, provide personalized uh, medicine and cancer care. And how can we do that? Well, first we need to identify which patients uh, are um, benefiting from certain types of therapies and which patients are not benefiting from those therapies or which patients need more aggressive treatment. So for example, if, patient, if we uh, remove the cancer surgically, however, we know that these patients will need additional therapy. Can we predict that before the surgery and then provide that aggressive treatment after surgery uh, to provide uh, better um, quality of life and survival? Uh, so this is an active area of research that, I've, uh, that I'm quite interested in. Um, one of the other areas is uh, something called methylation, which essentially really in layman's terms works, it turns out to be is that not all genes are active at, active at all times. Now, a lot of people have heard about mutations and uh, cancer um, uh, uh, mutations that can impact uh, uh, the way the cancer behaves, but there's also this whole component where not all genes, even within the cancer, are turned on at all times. And so how, how does that impact the, the aggressiveness of the cancer is an active interest of mine. Next uh, slide, please. Um, one of the ways that we, uh, we've, uh, we've started to study this is by looking at immunomethylomics. It's a fancy word and a very hard to pronounce, but essentially it means is that can we predict which genes are on in immune cells within the cancer, uh, within the head and neck cancer, um, and uh, utilize that uh, concept and look at the tumor, uh, the primary tumor, look at the lymph nodes where it's uh, spreading to, and also look at the blood in, uh, in the plasma and combine these three to predict early recurrences or make treatment changes or predict the aggressiveness of the cancer and then treat them appropriately. Um, thankfully, we've received some pilot funding for this, but we hope to uh, leverage um, uh, 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 the early results into translating into a um, bigger study where we can uh, uh, make some real headway uh, going forward. Next slide, please. I have several collaborators, of course, uh, in my research uh, endeavors, and so, uh, like I said, even the surgery is a team sport and so is research. Uh, of course, our chair, Dr. Christine Chung, uh, and uh, the rest of the team with my behavioral outcomes uh, folks, uh, biostatistician, Dr. Xu Feng, and the uh, cell-free DNA and the methylomics uh, with Dr. Liang Wang. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of want to uh, shed some light in uh, um, uh, and give you a, a perspective of what uh, patients have reported uh, back to me. And um, what, what I asked them is, what advice would you give to future patients? And uh, one of the patients said, you know, do not be afraid, do not fear. Uh, your life is more important than cancer. Family is more important than cancer. Trust the doctors, but also ask questions. Uh, another patient said, you have to listen to the team's assessment and become educated on what works best for you. And uh, they added that Moffitt provides that opportunity uh, in a multidisciplinary setting where patients get a chance to meet with 
the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist and a surgeon and try to come up with a treatment plan where those assessments are done in, uh, uh, in congruence. Another patient said, you know, you have to have patience during recovery. You're not going to get better overnight. You have to look from week to week and not day to day. Uh, and that's something that I reemphasize for all of my patients. Next slide, please. Something else I, I did, I, the patient, my patients have brought up to me and I said, you know, why, why did you choose Moffitt? And um, uh, one of the patients said, you know, if you have a situation of this magnitude, meaning cancer, Moffitt is where uh, it's to be. Uh, another patient said Moffer is where he knew he had to be. Some patients get treated elsewhere because of convenience, but he knew that he had to go to Moffitt because Moffitt portrays a strong team. And that doesn't include just me or my surgical colleagues, but it includes the anesthesiologist, to the nurses, to the speech therapist, to the physiotherapist. Uh, everybody was professional. Um, uh, he, in fact, said uh, he's a product of a team uh, that was led by. Uh, by the surgeon um, uh, in a very uh, sort of sports metaphor. Uh, another patient said, you're not left alone. Uh, you're educated. You're given freedom and opportunity to think about the options and choose treatment options. You know, when patients come to us, they, they, we recognize that there's a, there's a lot of anxiety um, uh, coming not only from the diagnosis, but what the next steps are uh, going to be. And, uh, uh, I can't emphasize that our team really uh, excels in that scenario where we, we, we try to anticipate what those needs are going to be and provide and educate as best as we can uh, to at least take that component of, uh, uh, out of the picture. Next slide, please. Like I said, it's, it's a team sport. Uh, you know, that patient that gave me that analogy, it's, it's a great one. Uh, yes, we clinicians are the face of the team, but behind the scenes, uh, there, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, people um, that, are, that are helping, uh, and uh, really everybody does their part, and that's what really makes uh, uh, our, our clinic and uh, allow us to provide that excellent care that, that we, can, uh, we can provide to our patients. Uh, thank you very much, and that should be the end. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that very nice talk as well. And we appreciate all the hard work that you do. So next on the agenda is to talk about our endocrine oncology program. And I wanted to introduce two of my wonderful colleagues. The first is Dr. Valentina Tarasova. She is an assistant member and as an endocrinologist in her department. And then Dr. Kristen Otto, who is one of our head and next vertical oncologists and is an associate member. So Dr. Otto, Dr. Tarasova, uh, take it away. Thank you, Kadar. So I'm going to start our combined portion of discussion in the endocrine oncology section. Um, I am Kristen Otto, as Kadar mentioned. I'm one of the head and neck surgeons. Um, at this point in my practice, the lion's share of my practice is dealing with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about our group. Our group is a really interesting group. We're a pretty new group and we are part of the head and neck program, uh, mostly because there's a lot of crossover between our surgical realm. Um, we were formally established in 2014 and currently the endocrine program is made up of five endocrinologists. Although I'd say to call them endocrinologists is probably a little bit of a short sell because truly they're endocrine oncologists who take care of the gamut of, uh, of the oncology portion of the endocrine field. We have six head and neck surgeons and we also have our three medical oncologists that cross over from head and neck. Within the endocrine section of our department, uh, we treat the gamut of endocrine related oncology diseases, including thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, adrenal nodules and adrenal cancers, pituitary tumors, and then also uh, deal a lot with cancer therapy related endocrine problems, particularly with the widespread use of immunotherapy. We pride ourselves and we feel that it is so important to give patients a multidisciplinary approach. That's the team that Dr. Patel was, was um, alluding to. Uh, we think this is the best way to manage not only thyroid nodules, but also the most complex adrenal cancers. Next slide, please. So I'd like to spend a little bit of uh, time just touching on our sort of innovative management of thyroid nodules uh, within our group. 
The reason that thyroid nodules are important to discuss is because they're so vastly common. So of those of you in the audience tonight, there's about 70 participants in this webinar, and at least 35 of you, whether you know it or not, have a thyroid nodule. They're so common. Uh, we like to tell patients by age 50, more than 50% will have a nodule by age 60, more than 60%. So at some point in your life, it becomes more common to have one than not. But fortunately for most patients and for most nodules, the nodules are benign. So we know that greater than 95% of them are benign. So this means it's really incumbent upon us to understand which nodules deserve further intervention, further workup, biopsy, and then potentially come on to surgery. Unfortunately, the gold standard for thyroid biopsy at this point in time is still not perfect and it's fine needle aspiration. So that's taking a tiny little needle, putting it into the nodule and drawing off just a tiny fraction of the cells within that nodule. When we get the results from those biopsies, many times we get a, we don't know, we get an indeterminate. So at least or about a third of our biopsies come out indeterminate. And in times past and classically, the way that we've handled indeterminate nodules is we've taken those patients to surgery to either remove a side of the thyroid or maybe even in some cases, the whole thyroid. But what we know is it's probably not the best way to do things because it leads to probably at least three quarters of our thyroid operations being considered unnecessary, meaning it came out benign. So if we had known or if we had a way to know better, then we could have avoided that surgery for that patient. Next slide, please. So the classic management of thyroid nodules has been start out with assessment with ultrasound, perform a fine needle aspiration biopsy, which oftentimes leads to a diagnostic surgical procedure, which as I said before, has the problem of in many cases, uh, turning out to be surgery that was done for benign disease that probably could have been avoided for the patient. There's probably a better way. And I think we've sort of recognized that very significantly here in our group at Moffitt. Next slide, please. So this is how we have moved uh, the group forward to do better management of thyroid nodules here at Moffitt. So obviously we start with the gold standard ultrasound and then biopsy, but we've really pushed the envelope on molecular profiling of thyroid nodules. So this is where we can actually delve into mutations, fusions, um, things that make a particular nodule very high risk to be a cancer. And then we can favor operating on those uh, nodules rather than those that look like they're gonna likely turn out to be benign. We've also gotten together as a group and come up with those criteria that we think ultimately make a nodule much more likely to be cancer, which uh, has led to not only a, a sort of a nomogram for risk stratification, but also the development of a, an entire pathway to deal with thyroid nodules. And this has been through not only consensus opinion, but also multidisciplinary review. This way we can more, um, more uh, creatively offer surgery only for those nodules that are truly high risk and lead to more um, number of our surg surgical procedures for thyroid nodules being done for those that really need it and uh, hopefully avoid surgery for those that really are benign. We've also uh, pushed forward with uh, starting to offer ablation techniques uh, for benign thyroid nodules. So either alcohol ablation for cystic nodules or even radiofrequency ablation for solid nodules that are benign that are causing symptoms for patients. Next slide, please. One of the things that I think is really important, we talked about molecular profiling and so within the past five to 10 years, um, various molecular tests have come on the market that can be utilized to try to determine when a thyroid nodule is in that gray zone, comes out indeterminate, whether it is truly high risk and requires surgery or whether it is more low risk and can be safely observed for the patient, avoiding an unnecessary operation. Um, these molecular tests are sometimes hard to interpret. They're not always applicable center to center. And so it actually has led to a lot of confusion and a lot of maybe inappropriate um, application of these tests. So um, one of the things that our group has done here at Moffitt that I'm uh, very proud of is uh, one of the first and very largest independent validation studies of one of the common uh, molecular uh, profiles, which is called Thyroseq, uh, making sure that we truly understand not only when uh, our, we get our biopsies back, what's the true risk of malignancy, but then which molecular mutations and fusions are truly high risk for patients and need to go to surgery and which ones can be safely observed. Um, the test is only 
only as good as the information that goes in. And so if you don't understand the information that goes in, it's very hard to interpret the information that comes out of it. Next slide, please. So what we understand and what I think all of the speakers have really stressed uh, tonight um, and really truly applies to not only thyroid nodules, but also thyroid cancer is that personalized care is key. We are very proud of our multidisciplinary approach. We uh, have a very strong opinion that when patients get referred to Moffitt for thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer and also all cancers within our head and neck group that they truly do get multidisciplinary care and personalized care. Next slide, please. So uh, we understand that that multidisciplinary and team approach provides peace of mind for patients. Um, like I said, we have a very well-established multidisciplinary clinic within the endocrine group. So if you have a thyroid nodule or a thyroid cancer and you get referred as a new patient to our group, you will very likely come in and on very first meeting, not only meet with a surgeon, but also meet with a, uh, an endocrinologist. You might also get a same day ultrasound and possibly even a same day biopsy, which can be very um, relieving for patients uh, who are stressed about new diagnoses. We also are proud of our tumor boards. So like many of the other groups, we have a weekly uh, tumor conference. All of the doctors who treat uh, endocrine diseases get together and discuss best ways to manage not only um, the routine cases, but also the complex cases. Um, and that information then gets uh, fed back to the patients uh, so that they know that they're not only getting one opinion, but many opinions when they come for care at Moffitt. We also have pathways. So. Uh, we have developed um, schema or uh, kind of flow charts for management of each of the disorders within our endocrine group uh, that have been um, very uh, tried and true and tested uh, over the time that they've been utilized. That means that when you come and see me, when you come and see Dr. Tarasova, one of the other surgeons, one of the other endocrinologists that you know, you're going to get relatively standardized care that is thought to be state-of-the-art and uh, evidence-based. Next slide, please. With this, I think I'd like to turn the rest of our endocrine presentation over to Dr. Tarasova. Now that I've given a little bit of rundown on thyroid nodules, she's going to discuss thyroid cancer. Hello, uh, my name is Valentina Tarasova. I'm an endocrinologist at Moffitt. I have special clinical and research interest in thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, and other endocrine diseases. So thyroid cancer is a, a common cancer. Over 52,000 of new cases were diagnosed in 2020. And at some point, thyroid cancer was one of the most rapidly growing cancer in the country. Thankfully, a patient doing really well with, uh, who were diagnosed with thyroid cancer with a five-year survival over 98.3%. Oh, 98 Usually diagnosed around age 50, but we see a significant um, rate of diagnosis among younger patients. Young patients actually doing much better compared to older population, and unfortunately, the majority of the deaths that we, death that we see in thyroid cancer patients are seen in older patients. Next slide. That slide actually reflects um, the new cases of thyroid cancer and the death rates from thyroid cancer. And you can see over the last uh, 40 years, and you can see that at some point around 2000, the curve of new diagnosis went significantly up. So we start to diagnose much more thyroid cancer. And this is probably because we started to uh, do routine, uh, did more imaging and wide, wide availability of the imaging, the, dominated and we biopsied more of these nodules. At some point we reached plateau and now we're becoming more selective which nodules we biopsy and consequently that reflects in some of the decline in diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Despite of that, all these new cases that uh, we start to diagnose with thyroid cancer and all this advancement with uh, therapies, there has not been change over the last 40 years in death rates from thyroid cancer. And this is one of the areas that uh, we need to focus on. Next slide. So from my standpoint, thyroid cancer is, uh, thyroid itself is a fascinating gland because in one gland, we can have the best, not, not the best, but one of the slowest growing, the least progressive, the uh, least worrisome cancers in, in a patient. On the other hand, the same gland can uh, present with the most aggressive cancer that a human can have anaplastic thyroid cancer. So papillary thyroid cancer 
and all follicular thyroid cancer, and then it, evo it can uh, evolve to poorly differentiated and an aplastic thyroid cancer. And where the patient is diagnosed with this um, in the spectrum, it's our goal to determine. We know that the patients with the more differentiated, well-differentiated thyroid cancer, they have less of mutations, they're more sensitive to standard therapies like radioactive iodine. They also has less of progressive disease, less disease that, many, that we can see on PET scans. On the other hand, uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer is the, patient, the cancer that usually goes with a much higher mutation burden with uh, less, uh, I think that, uh, can we come back to the previous slide? I think so. Okay. No, before, one more. And one more. Okay, so and as opposed to anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is the highest mutation burden, that is red, really very aggressive and very difficult to treat and has the worst prognosis. Next slide. So in the past, uh, thyroid cancer uh, was managed based on the principle one size fits all. So patients were diagnosed with thyroid cancer, they will go into surgery, and they almost universally received total thyroidectomy. After that, they were treated with radioactive iodine, and they were treated for long with thyroid hormone suppression therapy and were followed for long. Now, uh, next slide. Now we recognize, so not a single patient with thyroid cancer behaves the same. We can recognize these fine details on the uh, clinical features, pathological features, molecular profiling. So we tailor uh, personalized medicine for thyroid cancer in uh, 2021. Uh, diagnosis of cancer, even that uh, has been um, debated and became, became uh, uh, very selective. We don't biopsy small disease. We offer active surveillance for this. Molecular profile, profiling plays a significant role in determining prognosis. So knowledge of the mutational status and uh, other genetic abnormalities help us also to tailor therapy for patients with thyroid cancer. We learn to recognize different clinical pathological features. And based on these features, we also risk stratify patients in a low risk group and high risk group. And based on this, we tailor therapy. We also not only offer th total thyroidectomy for patients for thyroid cancer, we offer lobectomy and sometimes we offer um, um, uh, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. We also uh, determine the need for lymph node dissection and uh, we offer also some non-invasive technique like radio consideration offering radiofrequency ablation and ethanol ablation for some of the metastatic lymph nodes. Radioactive iodine is not given universally right now. It's very selective process. So that's also something that is done on an individual basis. And surveillance is also um, determined based on the patient's risk. So we recognize that not everybody will need to be on the high suppressive dose of thyroid hormones, which carry with themselves the, some potential risks for other diseases. Next slide. Um, thankfully, um, metastatic thyroid cancer, meaning spreading uh, thyroid cancer spread outside the neck is very rare, uh, but this patient had actually very few options um, until recently. On, in 1975, FDA approved doxorubicin as a uh, th thyroid cancer therapy. And for many, pa for many years, patients with metastatic disease did not have um, any alternatives. Now, since 2011, that has been significant uh, number of um, systemic therapies that has been approved for thyroid cancer and every couple of years we get new ones. So this is exciting time and it's actually for clinicians, it's uh, uh, exciting time to offer our patients uh, newer therapies. Next slide. So as I, as I mentioned before that thyroid cancer patients they live, have longevity. And uh, in general, we, we don't say that thyroid cancer is a good cancer. They, it's frequently uh, quoted outside, but you know, patients who have thyroid cancer, they carry certain level of anxiety, even if they do well, they still concern about recurrence. They dealing with surgical complications. They dealing with side effects of radioactive iodine. They have financial burden of life, uh, of long follow-up, if not lifelong follow-up. They need to come to a physician to 
to for regular checkups, they uh, need to be on thyroid hormone therapy, but, but which by itself represents another level of complexity for our patients. So we recognize that our thyroid cancer patients, they have uh, poor quality of life uh, compared to the other individuals and they live long lives. So we need to understand and to balance how much to do, when to do and when not to do and actually uh, how much to do for patients because sometimes aggressive therapies may not necessarily bring better outcomes but can harm the patients along the way. Next slide. So future directions uh, for thyroid cancer. Um, we at Moffitt, uh, we've been working on developing clinical trial pro portfolio for patients with uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, there are many treatment opportunities such as redifferentiation re therapies where we patients who were previously not sensitive or not as sensitive to radioactive iodine, they can receive the agents that potentially can enhance their radioactive iodine uptake. Immunotherapy is actually one of the ongoing clinical trials at Moffitt is a combination of uh, FDA-approved agent plus immunotherapy. New adjuvant is exciting area uh, in the thyroid world because frequently patients present with disease that is already not resectable or um, is invading vital structures and um, uh, surgery represents significant risk of resection. So given medications that can shrink the tumor before the surgery can actually result in better surgical outcome. Also, uh, since patients, uh, we are working on some um, understanding why do patients do certain decisions regarding their thyroid uh, uh, cancer and thyroid nodal surgeries. Because in, as, as you um, get the sense that thyroid, um, a lot of in the thyroid is in gray zone. Sometimes we can do things, sometimes we don't, we don't have to do things. It's easy actually if it's, uh, if it's certain, if we need to have surgery or don't have, but a lot of it is, is um, in gray zone. So why do patients, pay patients take the decisions? Do they regret their outcomes? This is something that is also potential areas for research. Also, um, uh, we're focusing on patient uh, related outcomes and interventions that we need to do in order to prevent these um, negative outcomes of our therapies. We're also um, working on developing endocrine oncology fellowship. It's actually a few centers in the country who have um, thyroid, uh, not only thyroid, but like endocrine oncology focused groups. Um, and uh, we will be, I think it will be very important to educate next generation of clinicians and researchers who would actually be exposed to high volume of um, endocrine uh, neoplasms, endocrine cancers, and would learn from the uh, experience that we have at Moffitt. So that's something that will be hopefully coming in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarasova uh, and Dr. Otto for your nice talks on the endocrine oncology program here. I wanted to take a moment to introduce one of our partners here at Moffitt, uh, David Curry. David is with the Moffitt Foundation and the partners with the Head Neck an endocrine program, and he helps to ensure that we receive the research dollars we need to get clinical research off the ground here, and also to make innovative advances in cancer treatments. So if you would like to learn more about how you can help, please contact David to find out more. I'll let David um, talk for a few minutes as well. So David. Thank you, Dr. Katani. Uh, on behalf of the Moffa Foundation, uh, we're so thrilled to be able to host this webinar tonight for the Head and Neck Endocrine Oncology Program at Moffitt. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kirtani and Dr. McMullen uh, for being the moderators tonight and to our presenters, uh, Drs. Uh, Otto, uh, Tarasova, Patel, and Mu uh, Muzafar. We really appreciate you giving us some time because we know how busy you are and uh, it's, it's important that uh, you join us tonight so that you can hear from these wonderful folks. Uh, my role at the foundation uh, is to be the liaison for this program. And so uh, I'll never treat a patient and I'll never conduct research. Uh, but what I can do is I can try to bridge the gap uh, of support between what they're doing and uh, individuals and families. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can support uh, these efforts, these important initiatives through uh, private philanthropy, then uh, please contact me and we will explore the options uh, that, uh, that you can all uh, consider and then hopefully support this important work.
Thanks again for joining us tonight. And now we're going to go to the most important, uh, not the most important, but the most popular part of our uh, presentation, which is the Q&A. And I will just say before I sign off, uh, if you submit a question and it's not answered tonight, uh, we're going to follow up with you and we're going to we're going to get you those answers. So if they don't get answered tonight, uh, we'll send you an email with the appropriate answer. Thanks again, uh, Dr. McMullen. Thank you so much, David, and thanks to all of our presenters tonight. I was really, really um, engaged and I enjoyed everything that you guys talked about tonight. I think it was helpful for our audience. So we have some great questions from our participants today. Um, I'm going to read them aloud and then I'll shoot them over to one of you guys. So um, Dr. Patel, I'll direct this first one to you. Um, what is the next big thing in research in head and neck cancer, especially on the surgery side? Um, I, um, you know, I, I think the, the ability to identify which patients are going to benefit from surgery uh, and um, and appropriate treatment strategies, whether it's uh, less aggressive treatment or more aggressive treatment, I think that's the, the key. Um, as Dr. Muzaffar alluded to, and Dr. Kirtani is leading a cell therapy trial. And um, I think that's, that's another exciting part uh, about what Moffitt has to offer in terms of the research. I think there's a good integration of surgeons and uh, basic science researchers and uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology, where all of us can bring in our perspectives, um, whether it's obtaining uh, tissues and uh, identifying these biomarkers, uh, working with basic science researchers and translating them into lab experiments and then bringing them uh, to the patient side. Um, whether it's on the surgery side or through our medical oncology colleagues in form of drugs or cell therapy, uh, it, it really just brings back a full circle. And I think that's what um, uh, really the exciting part uh, uh, in terms of the research at Moffitt uh, is going to be. Uh, you know, as Dr. Muzaffar alluded to in his early introductory slide, the clinical trial enrollment portfolio has grown substantially uh, and the number of patients are, that are being recruited. And I, I, that, again, that's a real opportunity of who is benefiting from these treatments? Who are the early responders? Who are non-responders? And how can we focus on the non-responder group and make that better? Uh, I think that, to me, that's where the value holds. So, um, and, and the minimally invasive surgeries that we are expanding, right? I think um, the, to me, the type of cancer and where it is, is what dictates the treatment, whether it's uh, the robotic surgery that we can offer, the laser surgery that we can offer, or the endoscopic uh, synonasal and skull-based options, um, all of it, really. Yeah, so it, it sounds like really the next big thing is personalizing it in all sorts of different arenas, both surgical, medical, endocrine and head and neck cancer specific. That's Dr. Right. Mugwell, and I'll just add to kind of piggyback off of Dr. Patel that I think for at least from a medical oncology perspective, really modulating the immune system to, you know, kill cancer is really the new big thing, I think, in treatments. You know, they say that there are more cells in the human body than there are galaxies in the known universe. We just got to figure out how to use your own immune cells to really attack the cancer. And I think that's really the next wave. I may be biased, but I, that's sort of my perspective as well. Thank you. All right, we'll get to our next question. We're racking them up over here. Uh, Dr. Muzaffar, I'll direct this to you. What treatment is available for patients with thyroid cancer that's metastasized after receiving radioactive iodine and radiation? Right, so, you know, thyroid cancer, as Dr. Tarasola was saying, has been, uh, you know, treated effectively for a long time, but we also start seeing patients with metastatic disease. So currently, the standard of care for thyroid cancer is, is a group of drug called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and our experience all over the place has been that it, they're hard to tolerate. So in line with the research in other cancers, we now have immunotherapy uh, coming in as an option for thyroid cancer, and we have our, the big trial here where we're combining a lower dose of tyrosine kinase inhibitor with immunotherapy. So our goal is to combine these two uh, uh, treatments together to make the, it more effective and, and also less toxic because with thyroid cancer, the most important 
problem that we have faced is the treatment that we have right now is very, very toxic. So we do have an exciting trial for differentiated thyroid cancer of patients here uh, involving immunotherapy. Similarly, uh, for anaplastic thyroid, <clears throat> which is again another very aggressive cancer, we have a trial coming up, uh, which also involves immunotherapy because we do have preliminary data showing that immunotherapy is very uh, is much uh, more effective in, in thyroid cancers because of the nature of the thyroid uh, cancer itself and the amount of immune cells that we see in the thyroid tissue in cancer patients. So that is the next area of research uh, in thyroid cancer and we have trials involving immunotherapy. Dr. McMullen, can I add just one thing to that? When thyroid cancer has metastasized to other sites, sometimes we actually have the ability to focus treatment at those sites. And so another benefit of our group is, you know, as we keep saying all over tonight, multidisciplinary management, um, sometimes radiation therapy, you know, if thyroid cancer has metastasized to the bones, occasionally we will use radiation therapy or other sort of ablative techniques to um, combat those lesions. Oftentimes these lesions, if it's, if it's differentiated thyroid cancer, are slow growing and the problems they cause are local symptoms. So if we can combat those local symptoms with local therapies, such as ablation or radiation, sometimes that gives our patients a lot, uh, a significant improvement in their quality of life. That's very true, yes. We have to um, get everyone involved when we're in a serious situation like that. So it, it's seven o'clock. I think maybe we'll try to squeeze in one more question if everyone's okay with it. Uh, Dr. Tara Sova, I'll shoot this one over to you. Uh, does genetic testing reveal mutations in genes that will put me at risk for specific cancers? Yes, we know some of the syndromes uh, that um, uh, could manifest as uh, thyroid. Uh, I will be speaking about maybe about thyroid cancer and which mutations could be related to that. So we know that there are some mm -hmm. syndromes and uh, we can recognize them clinically. And it's important to have genetic testing uh, if the symptoms, if the uh, symptoms are put together, because that help us to determine future follow-up. It will help us to determine the aggressiveness of our uh, management approach. So we will have actually a genetic team that is uh, uh, that can see patients for the syndromes that also can help guide therapy for the, the uh, for patients, uh, siblings and their children. And also um, not only, we have also something that's called personalized medicine. So all the patients who have aggressive presentation will also uh, involve uh, that team and uh, that help us to give individualized treatment for every patient with thyroid cancer. Thank you so much. All right, I think that's all we have time for tonight. There are a couple more questions that we didn't get to answer tonight, but um, as uh, Stacy said, we, uh, and David said, we can answer those after the webinar and get those out to you guys. So uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to uh, David, Stacy, Jessica, and the rest of the team that helped put this together. And I really appreciate all of our participants and attendees tonight. Um, thanks for being engaged and asking really great questions. And hopefully we'll uh, be able to do this again soon. So thank you again and have a great night. Thank you.